pay attention here to where we are because this is not, not for me to, uh, anyway, I'm not real comfortable because I haven't done this for a long time. I told Pastor Ken that I would probably just stand up here and shake, so if you see me doing that, don't just ignore it. Well, our scripture readings this morning. Come from the book of John first. John 14, verses 8 through 17. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. <coughs> Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Our second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. In the first book, Theophilus, Theophilus, I taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father will have set up by his own authority, but you will receive power when his has, excuse me, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together the crowd numbered about 120 persons, and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language, Hakael Tadamba, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, 
Let his homestead become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of overseer. This is the reading and the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this week, if you don't know it already by all the beautiful things up here at the altar, is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost was always difficult for me to understand while I was growing up. I never really understood what the Trinity was, let alone the part of the Holy Spirit and what it played. I also assumed it meant that there were three separate people that paddled around together all the time since they are almost always mentioned together. These were just words and sermons that my friends and I would sometimes listen to and sometimes not. And I think it's important to note here that I didn't grow up in a home where we talked about faith or God or Jesus or attend church as a family. As a matter of fact, when I was five years old, I told my parents that I wanted to go to Sunday school and church and that they needed to take me. So my mom would get me up and drive me three blocks to the church every Sunday and drop me off and come back to get me when church was over. That, I believe, was the time when I started to really understand a little bit about my relationship with God and Jesus. But it wasn't until I began my studies to become a licensed local pastor that I had to really wrestle with this concept of the Holy Trinity and understand the importance it plays not only in my life, but in all of our lives. It was one of the hardest things that I encountered in my quest for knowledge about God and Jesus. And of course, we can't forget to throw in the Holy Spirit to make it even more exciting. I'm still not sure I do a very good job of explaining it to others, but I'm going to give it my best shot this morning. Most all of us know that on July 4th, 1776, the members of the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia and signed the Declaration of Independence. With that action, the American Revolution was launched and a new nation was about to be born. It's ironic that on that very day, George III, King of England, made an entry in his diary stating, nothing of any importance happened today. <laughs> on the day of Pentecost in the year 30 AD, 120 followers of a man called Jesus were gathered together in Jerusalem when suddenly the Spirit of God filled each one of them and marked them with tongues of fire. On that day, the church was born. But no historian of the time saw any significance in this event. Those 120 disciples were just a handful of rather ordinary men and women, a few fishermen, a couple of housewives, a former tax collector, a few farmers, and some servant girls. Yet through those ordinary people, God built a church that has lasted now for over 2,000 years. In less than 300 years, that small, insignificant Jewish sect became the official religion of the entire Roman Empire. And today, the church founded on Jesus Christ circles the globe in numbers of <coughs> 1 billion members. How did they do it? What actually happened to those 120 followers in the year of 30 AD on the day that we call Pentecost? Well, those 120 followers came in contact with Christians' unknown God. They came in contact with the Holy Spirit. And for many Christians, the event of Pentecost, the, the events of God's Spirit coming to earth is like what King George said on the day our Declaration of Independence was signed. Nothing of any importance happened today. Well. As I said, today is Pentecost Sunday, one of the four major festivals of our church year. Today, we celebrate the coming of God's Spirit in the lives of men, women, and children. Today is the day we celebrate the birthday of the church. 
But if you didn't come to church today, you might not even know this was a major festival of the church year. Yet today is just as important in the history of Christianity as Christmas and Easter. It's just as important as the Festival of Ascension we celebrated last week. But for some unknown reason, this holiday in our church goes by almost unnoticed. Today, I want to touch on why that might be. You know, it could be because we have a difficult time getting a handle on the Spirit of God. Most of us, even those who lived during that time, don't understand what exactly happened on that day. And maybe it's because talk about the Holy Spirit isn't as sweet or as visual as talking about a baby born in a manger, and angels singing in the heavens, and gifts being passed about, and shepherds sending their flocks by night. Maybe Pentecost didn't get much attention because we haven't found a way to commercialize it. We haven't turned Pentecost into a cultural extravaganza or into a national holiday. So it goes quietly unnoticed. But this festival, this holiday is very important, not only in the life of the church, but also in our lives individually. The Spirit of God isn't something we can or should ignore, because the Holy Spirit is God's presence in our world. It's the same presence that was moving over the face of the earth when God created this world in which we live. It's the same presence that took the form of a baby born in a manger in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. It's the same Spirit of God that walked the earth for 33 years, teaching and healing and proclaiming the love of God to all people. And now today, it's the same Spirit that is in us. It's God's Spirit, alive and well on earth, working through His people, the church, to bring His love into a world that certainly can use it. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit more. The source of the Holy Spirit is, of course, God. And as Christians, we believe in the Trinity. God the Father, who creates God the Son, who redeems, and God the Holy Spirit, who gathers, calls, enlightens, sanctifies, or makes his people holy. God is one, but at the same time he shows himself in three different ways. Here are some visuals for you to think about. God the Father is seated in heaven right now, and Jesus the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is on the earth in believers' hearts. Each one is God, but yet there's only one God. He shows up in three persons, maybe so that we can better understand Him and His place in our lives. It's been said that God is like water, solid, liquid, and gas. God's also been compared to a runny, gooey pie you can cut it into three pieces, and it's all over the place, but it's still all one pie. It's also been said that God's like an egg, the yolk, the white, and the shell. All one egg, but three parts. However you want to picture it, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one trinity. It's the third part of the trinity, this third manifestation of God that we celebrate on this day of Pentecost. The power of God's Spirit came to earth on that long ago day. Now as you know, power can be used in at least two ways. It can be unleashed or it can be harnessed. The energy of 10 gallons of gas, for example, can be released explosively by dropping a lighted match into the gas can. Or it can be channeled through the engine of my car in a controlled burn. And used to transport me about 250 miles. Explosions are spectacular. Think about how much we like fireworks. But controlled burns have lasting effects or staying power. The Holy Spirit works in both ways. At Pentecost, he exploded on the scene. 
he had so much staying power, and his presence was like tongues of fire, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Thousands were affected by one burst of God's power. But he also works through the church, the institution that God began to tap the Holy Spirit's power for the long haul through worship and fellowship and service. All this happens day in and day out in our lives. The Spirit is quietly at work every single day we live. The Spirit is there with the farmers as they work in the fields, or with the businessmen as they manage an office, or with parents raising their families. This Spirit of God is there in everything we do. The Holy Spirit brings His power into our lives in a quiet and unobtrusive way. There is a story about a sunken ship that illustrates the quietness of the Spirit, but at the same time shows His power in our lives. Several years ago, engineers building a new bridge over the East River in New York discovered the wrecked hull of a ship so many years before they right where the center piers were to be built. Powerful machinery was brought in to remove the ship, but it wouldn't budge. Then one of the engineers had an unusual idea. Why not have the tide raise the ship? So some strong cables were attached to the hull, and when the tide came in, the barge gradually lifted up the sunken ship. It was then towed into the ocean and sunk in a spot that would not cause future problems. God's Holy Spirit is like that tide. It comes quietly, it comes slowly, but it comes to us with enough power so that we do what God has led each of us to do in our lives. There is a power or force for some, an untapped force in each of our lives. That is the Holy Spirit. Most of the time it's nothing dramatic. It doesn't cause us to do dramatic things, but it's there to give us the power, the energy to live the kind of lives and to be the kind of people God intends us to be. The nature of the Spirit empowers us to live with our first priorities pointing to Christ. The kind of life Christ hopes for us to live points not to us in all our accomplishments, but to Christ and the things that we achieve in His name. It's this Spirit that comes into our lives, into the church, to allow us to spread God's message of love to all people. It's this Spirit that points not to itself, but to Christ. And it's the Spirit that allows us to point not to ourselves, not to ourselves, but to Christ. It makes the church the most unique organization on the face of the earth. Russ Flowers, a minister in Indianapolis, was asked to give a brief statement about his job to the local Rotary Club. This is what he told them. I'm with the Global Enterprise, and we have branches in every country in the world. We have our representatives in nearly every parliament and boardroom on earth. We're into motivation and behavior alteration. We run hospitals, feeding stations, crisis pregnancy centers, universities, publishing houses, and nursing homes. We care for our clients from birth to death. We're into life insurance and fire insurance. We perform spiritual heart transplants. Our original organizer owns all the real estate on Earth, plus an assortment of galaxies and constellations. He knows everything and lives everywhere. Our product is free for the asking, yet there's enough, not enough money to buy it. Our CEO was born in a hick town, worked as a carpenter, didn't own a home, was misunderstood by his family, hated by enemies, walked on water, was condemned to death without a trial, and arose from the dead. I talk with him every day. The church sounds pretty amazing when hearing it described like that. And what's exciting to me is that we are part of it, not because we've done anything, but because of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, if we allow it to take up residence within. 
So how do we get that fresh touch of the Spirit? How do we get a new soul of, of fire in our, in our souls? There are three thoughts found in the book of Acts that I will share. First, in Acts chapter 11, verse 17, we're told we need to believe. We need to believe that there's more God that has, has in store in it for us. We're never a finished product in God's eyes, especially if we believe. Secondly, Acts chapter 4, verse 3, tells us that it's quite simple to ask. Asking the Holy Spirit to be part of our lives and to renew our energy and fire means that we know we need Him. That's where our servanthood comes from. And finally, in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it says to obey. To me, this means when we discern what it is God wants us to do with our lives, we're supposed to do it. It may take some of us a few years to give in to God's guidance, like me, but God is patient and never, never gives up on us. Many people talk about the Holy Spirit and they try to label a church or a person as Pentecostal or holy rollers or too out there as they roll their eyes. The talk of the Holy Spirit is fundamental to our beliefs and our faith. The Holy Spirit is what motivates this church in the ways we reach out to our community. Proclaiming that we have the Holy Spirit within us doesn't necessarily mean that we're jumping around, talking in tongues, trying to get people to notice us. Having the Holy Spirit in our church and in our lives is a quiet, constant presence upon which we can draw to know that we are loved by God, to give us the energy we need to share our faith with others, and to propel us to live our lives Christ-centered rather than self-centered. The power of the Holy Spirit was brought into the world this day over 2,000 years ago. And that power is still present today through us and within this church. As our verse hymn said, to the members of Christ's body, to the branches of the vine, to the church and faith assembled, to her midst as gift and sign, come Holy Spirit, come. So let's be sure not to be caught flat-footed. When we hear come, remember to whom we are to come, why we are to come, and how very much we are loved and are to spread this love to all of God's people. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Let us pray. Lord and giving love, Lord, <clears throat> thank you for your ever-present love of the Holy Spirit in our church and in our lives. What a gift you have given to us. To know you are always with us is comforting yet also empowering. Guide us in your ways, Lord. Help us to hear your soft whispers on the wind. Feel your gentle touch in the breeze and see your love through those people you place in our lives. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now time to give freely for our church, to give our offer.